Number five of the 24 ways to improve memory. Get adequate sleep. This is really my favorite suggestion because this is something we all enjoy doing. Getting enough sleep. College students on average are sleep deprived. Depending on uh, their predisposition, they're going to probably need at least eight hours of sleep per day. Most of them are not getting that, or at least not uh, Sunday night through Thursday night. Uh, but try to get adequate sleep. Um, make sure you're getting at least seven hours of sleep. Watch out for the sleep age. You know, the, if you're having a hard time sleeping, you took a, a sleep aid, an over-the-counter sleep aid, or a prescribed sleep aid, it's going to reduce the sleep quality. Uh, so you do need to uh, be careful on that. But be sure to get enough sleep. Now, I recognize that college students, their schedules are crazy uh, many times, and you might want to consider napping. Uh, napping can reset the clock, uh, can reduce some of that fatigue, and it's also helpful because if you nap, if you nap for 90 minutes, um, 90 minutes or a little more than that, you actually will go through a complete cycle of uh, sleep. You go through stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four, and then back up through REM, rapid eye movement sleep. And rapid eye movement sleep is probably when we cement memories into place, or what we call in memory research, consolidate them, uh, which means to coalesce them, for them to solidify. And you need sleep to do that. So this is an effective strategy where if you have, let's say you, are, you do have a situation where you can, your primary day to study is Sunday. I hope that's not the case. I hope you can study throughout the week. But if you find yourself in a situation where you have eight hours on Sunday to get the work done, one of the techniques you'd want to do would be to, to get up, get going, maybe exercise a little bit, and then study. Reach your maximum study. Get, get the hard stuff done. Um, for, so two to three hours. And then after that, uh, after you can't read the textbook anymore, you can't do the hardcore learning, you might have a list of some other things that you can get done. So printing out the PowerPoint slides, organizing previous lectures, uh, possibly reviewing some of the previous PowerPoint slides that you'd spent some time on, maybe making a few flashcards for things that you want to spend more time on later. So then you've got through maybe three and a half, four hours of studying time, then take a nap. Some people, and this is, you're just going to need to figure this out for yourself, some people benefit from the power naps. Those are the 15, 20 minute naps where you don't go into REM sleep. They have been shown to improve attention and visual vigilance, and some people report that they work really well. It's not going to consolidate it, and it's not going to completely prepare somebody for another two to three hours, but that's something that works for some people. But the 90 minute nap, or the 100 minute nap, Okay, the downside is they're difficult to wake up from. We get what's called sleep momentum, and if you go through that, that complete cycle, particularly if you're a little bit sleep deprived, your body's going to want to go into the next cycle and sleep for three hours, and uh, that's hard to do, so you need to be disciplined if that's the case. But once you get up, get a little bit of exercise, kind of have a chance to wake up, then you can sit down and you're probably able to get in another two hours. I'd probably do a different topic, um, but that's going to allow the first topic that you did earlier in the day to be consolidated during the nap, then you get up, do the second topic. Now you might be able to do, once again, a couple hours of hardcore textbook-like learning, and then do something else. And that's going to give you, you know, six or so you know, really good study hours in a day, uh, which is more than we normally can get. You also might try something like this after uh, an afternoon of being in classes. You know, a lot of times students will schedule classes where their you know, classes back to back to back for four or more hours. You're going to be exhausted, and that's you know particularly on the depending on the type of class. But if you're listening to a lecture like this lecture coming at you fast for 90 minutes or so, it's going to be hard to do a couple of those and then go to a textbook. So that's another opportunity where napping can help consolidate those memories. You might look at the notes that you took. Uh, during, the, during the morning classes, the afternoon classes, before sleeping, possibly look at them right when you wake up again, and then go you know, get something to eat, and then go do your two to three hours of hardcore studying. Uh, so the sleep can really help there. Another effective strategy, number six of the 24 ways to improve memory, is to review information before sleeping. This is an interesting and also very efficient strategy. Most strategies for memory, they require hard work. Uh, people want a silver bullet or a magic bullet. Tell me, how do I do this? How do I improve memory? There's a lot of ways to improve memory, but most of them are hard work. A few of them are more efficient, though, and reviewing before sleeping is an efficient strategy. 
So how you do this is some material that you've already learned. Maybe it's a lecture material that you have PowerPoint slides and uh, some handwritten notes. Or maybe it's notes that you took off of your own reading, your textbook reading. Or maybe it's flashcards that you're looking at. Whatever it is, review them before sleeping. Five minutes, maybe ten minutes just before going to bed. If you do that, it may be that you are more likely to consolidate or cement uh, in, into place the connections amongst neurons related to that information. It makes it more likely that those neurons are going to be activated and thus permanently involved in long-term memories. So it's a very efficient strategy, but one downside is if you have anxiety, if you have insomnia problems to start with, and sleep is a part of the cause of the stress, or a school is part of the cause of the stress, then doing that, thinking about an exam a couple days out, might not be a good thing for someone prone to insomnia to do right before uh, going to sleep. But as long as you don't have anxiety, insomnia problems like that, a uh, very efficient strategy. Number seven, rehearse, rehearse, rehearse. It's a very simple strategy, but just we need to rehearse the information. The information is new, you just need more exposure to it. Now, not all rehearsal is the same, so how you rehearse is important. It's much better to rehearse things, what we say is, at a deeper level as opposed to a shallow level. We want a deep level of processing. Some researchers call this an elaborative rehearsal strategy, where you elaborate upon the material rather than just repeating it over and over and over again in your head. So elaborate upon it, uh, try to connect it to other things, try to create a visual image, but whatever you do, we need to rehearse it. Now related to that, number eight, use a technique called expanding rehearsal. So how this strategy works is that every uh, time period between rehearsal increases. So if you learn something, let's say, uh, at a 10 a.m. class, well then rehearse it again when you have a little time, say at, at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and then 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and then before you go to bed, then the next day, and so on where the time between rehearsal trials increases every time. This is a strategy that the neuroscientists, people studying cells in petri dishes, found that you made more changes related to memory in the cells that weren't even alive, really. Uh, they're just being kept alive in a serum. When they provided the electrical stimulation, that sometimes led to changes in the channels and the structure of the cell related to memory that when they use the expanding rehearsal strategy, those changes were made more efficiently. So we find this is also true for humans and live cells. Uh, so the expanding rehearsal strategy is very effective. We do this at the clinic uh, where I work to help people overcome brain injury. Uh, they'll come in to do a group-based cognitive rehabilitation program, and we give them uh, a fact of the day, something we want them to remember. The people in this uh, program have a hard time making new memories. So we give them a fact of the day, just something silly, maybe like um, peanuts are not really nuts, they're legumes. Then uh, a minute after giving them that fact, we want them to think about it and create an image of it. Sometimes we'll ask them to draw a picture of what they're trying to remember. And then just two minutes later, what's the fact of the day? Then double that interval four minutes later, what's the fact of the day? Then double the interview interval before we test them again, eight minutes, what's the fact of the day? 16 minutes, what's the fact of the day? And then again at the end of our one hour session. And people with full-blown dementia, who generally are not making new long-term memories, can in that environment. Um, so that's just an example of the power of this. College students, people with good memories, can also take advantage of the expanding rehearsal. It does require a little bit of uh, attention. Um, I think one of the easiest ways that I've been able to do it in my life is if I had flashcards and you know, I knew that the flashcards were just made, I knew them pretty well, then I set them aside. Four hours later, I come back to them. Then eight hours later, I come back to them. And then the next day, come back to them. Two days after that, come back to them. And so in that way, you can put a little post-it note. Uh, take advantage of this. This, this will make memory uh, encoding more efficient. Number nine. Overlearn the material. Do you remember Herman Ebbinghaus? Well, Herman Ebbinghaus studied consonant, vowel consonants, nonsense syllables. Things like W-I-J, uh, X-I-B. 
No, they didn't mean anything. They had a consonant, a vowel, then a consonant. And they made little cards with them on. They made stacks. They ranged in size, but let's say uh, stacks of 25. And so he would have the stack of 25 cards with these nonsense words on them. And he would see one, uh, XIB, and that would remind him the next one is WIJ. And that would remind him the next one is uh, PUH. And that would remind him the next one is so on. He'd study these until he got them all right. I can't imagine doing that. It would be very boring. He must have been a very disciplined person. Um, did it back in the 1800s. And then he would set these flashcards aside. And he'd come back to them after 20 minutes, 60 minutes, 9 hours, or 1 day. And uh, he would see how many of them did he recall. Now if you look at the, if you look at the screen, at this graph, what we see is that the person forgets the information very rapidly. So Herman Ebbinghaus had the, uh, got them all right, got the cards all right one time, all 25 of them, and we call that 100%. Now if he went back uh, 20 minutes later, he was at 55%, correct. If he went back an hour after first learning it, he was less than 50%. The take home is, we forget information very rapidly. But one of the things he taught us was that if we overlearn the material, continue studying it after it's 100%. So let's see, maybe it took him 30 times to go through those flashcards to get to 100%. What if he studied them 50% more? Or another 15 times? 30 times to get them all right. What if he did it 15 times more? He just went through them 15 more times after that. Well, that would be like 150%. So if you look at the graph, you know, if it's at 100%, what happens when it goes down? Well, it rapidly goes down and reaches uh, an asymptote of, say, 25%. But if he continued studying and it was at 150%, the curve looks the same, but it doesn't go down as far. It's as if the whole curve is shifted up 50 points. So ultimately, it would asymptote or level out at, say, 75%. That's the beauty of overlearning. Continue to study something even after you know it. Moreover, don't assume that just because you got the information right one time that you're going to know it in a week. Chances are you won't. If you had just for the first time learned that information and then studied it, uh, or tried to recall it a week later, it's very likely that you would forget um, all or some of that information. So continue to study it. At the same time, you need to be honest with yourself or try to predict what you're going to know for sure in a couple of weeks or a couple of months for that matter. And you kind of can become aware of that. You're like, I know this awfully well. The students that can monitor their memory do better. We did a study, it was published in 2007 on college students. And in the study, published in the European Journal of Cognitive Psychology, we found that the college students that knew what they knew, they could better predict how much information uh, they were going to forget, um, how well they would do at something in the future, they were better students. And what we did was we had uh, students listen to and look at 20 Swahili English word pairs. They were presented on a screen uh, in an auditorium and there'd be things like uh, the Swahili word wingu, cloud. So wingu is the word for cloud. And we give them 20 of those words that nobody knew the Swahili, so it was all new information. And then we'd ask them, in 15 minutes, after you do another task with us for a while, how many of those 20 Swahili English word pairs will you get right? If we give you the Swahili word, how many times will you be able to come up with the English uh, uh, associate of that word? And you know, people varied. We did have a couple people that could get 20 out of 20, which was, it was rare, but a couple people did. Most people were getting, say, 8 or 7 out of the 20. But what we, were, what we wanted to know was how many did they think they were going to get right in 15 minutes, and then how many did they get right? Were they overconfident? Did they say, oh, I think I'll get 15 right, but then they got 10? Or were they underconfident? They say, no, in 15 minutes I think I'll get 8 right, but then they get 13 right. Well, what we found was the top 25% of SAT scorers compared to the bottom 25%. The top 25% of SAT scorers, first of all, they underestimated their performance. They said that they thought they would get 14 right, and they got 15 right. 
Um, but they were more calibrated. They were closer. The people in the bottom 25% of SAT scores, they said they thought they would get uh, 14 right, but they only got 9 right. So they were way overconfident. Now what we wanted to know was, over time, did they learn? Did they learn the task? Did they learn um, how easy or difficult it was for them to make these new Swahili English word pairs? So after every time they did that, we would say, okay, let's score your test. How well did you do? You said that you would get this many right. Let's score it. How many did you get? Were you underconfident? Were you overconfident? And then we had them do this five different days over two weeks. And that's a lot like the school environment.